Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly recap of our chronological reading through the Reese Chronological Bible. We're at the end of week number 41. We're at the 15th day of October in 2022. And we're just about four weeks away, four and a half weeks away from being completed with our journey from Genesis to eternity. So I would encourage you to uh, continue to stay up with your reading. And if you're behind, uh, don't get all upset. Just read a couple of days worth of reading each day and you'll get caught up. And you can certainly finish by the end of the year because if we stay on track, we finish by the 16th of November. This past week, our reading has been just full of information. So I'm going to have to try to hurry to get through all of what we read this past week in our time this afternoon. And we began this week's reading with Reese notating that it was the beginning of the dispensation of grace. It was at the end of last week that we got to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this week's reading began with a bold print subheading of the dispensation of the grace the church age. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom when Christ died on the cross. That was very significant because the only place that represented the presence of God on earth during those times was in the Holy of Holies, that special uh, room of the uh, temple that was shaped like a cube in which was the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and above it was the mercy seat, and that was the place where once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in and offer uh, blood sprinkling on the mercy seat for his sins and the sins of the people. And he was the only one that was allowed in that close to God's presence. But with the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and that veil being torn in two between the holy place and the holy of holies, it signifies to us that everyone, anyone who wants to, because and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, can enter into the very presence of God in prayer and uh, seek fellowship with Him. And so that was a very big, significant thing. Well, then we read about Jesus' burial, and it was reported, recorded in all four Gospels. And in John's account, we also saw that Nicodemus came with Joseph of Arimathea to request the body of Jesus and to put him in the, Joseph's grave. And so that gives us uh, confidence and hope that Nicodemus, that leader of teacher of the Pharisees that had come to Jesus early in his ministry at night, and Jesus explained to him in John chapter 3 about the necessity of being born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven, uh, became a believer. And so I find comfort in that and am happy for Nicodemus. The, uh, the day after the crucifixion, the chief priest and the Pharisees uh, spoke to Pilate, reminded him that Jesus had said that he would rise again three days after he was put to death. And they asked uh, Pilate to put a guard around the tomb so that no one would go and steal his body and say that he had been raised. Pilate said, well, you have a guard. Uh, you go do it yourself and make it as secure as you can. And the wording there almost gave us the idea that Pilate expected him, regardless of whether there was a guard or not, to uh, be raised from the dead. Resurrection Day came, first day of the week on Sunday. That's why we uh, have worship services around the world most of the time on Sundays because that designated the day that Jesus came forth from the, from the grave. And it was also recorded in all four Gospels. And it was the first day of the week, Sunday. And through the various Gospel accounts, we read of the various ladies that went to the tomb early in the morning that Sunday to hopefully anoint his body with uh, spices, anointments, and so forth. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, or Salome, brought spices 
and they discovered that the stone had already been rolled away. And an angel in a long white robe spoke to them, saying that he's not here, he's risen. And uh, they remembered then the words that he had said. They returned to the 11 who were uh, back in Jerusalem and told them of the things that they had seen and experienced. In another account, we see that Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene and it was after she had seen, when she looked into the, to the tomb there, uh, two angels, one sitting at the feet and one at where the head would have been of the Lord as he laid on the stone there in the, in the, uh, in the tomb. And it reminded me of the mercy seat itself above the Ark of the Covenant where there were angels on either side of that mercy seat with their wings folded and their faces pointing down towards the mercy seat. And I thought of that when every time I read that Mary had looked into the tomb and seen two angels, one at the head and one at the foot of where Jesus would have laid. And then Christ appeared to other women also and he told them to go and tell his brethren to go to Galilee and they would see him there. Well, then the next day we come to that great story that I like in the Gospel of Luke about the Emmaus Road Bible Seminar. Two of the disciples, not necessarily two of the 11 remaining apostles, but two disciples were on their way to uh, Emmaus a seven mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus and Jesus caught up with him and walked along and they did not recognize him. His, his identification was hidden from them and they began to give a report uh, and Jesus questioned them and we know how the story went that when they got to uh, Emmaus and they were going to go in uh, for the night and they uh, talked the Lord into coming in with them because it was getting late and as they sat and were about to have uh, something to eat, and when he broke bread, all of a sudden, uh, they realized who he was. And at that moment, he vanished out of their sight. And they were so excited that they ran back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles what had happened. We read that Jesus appeared to the, uh, would have been 10 apostles in the upper room because Thomas wasn't with them at that particular time. And it said that the door was shut and he appeared to them in their midst. So we see that uh, the glorified body that the Lord received after he was raised from the dead uh, has the uh, ability to go through walls or doors without opening them. Uh, I kind of look forward to that myself one of these days when we get a glorified body of our own. Then we read about John's account eight days later when Jesus appeared to them again which would have been on a Sunday as well, eight days later. And this time Thomas was with them. And uh, Jesus said to him, uh, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I believe that that speaks about you and me. And then we read about breakfast by the Sea of Galilee. And Peter was restored to fellowship and restored to service. And three times he was asked, do you love me more than these? And most of the time we associate those three times that he was asked that question to the three times that he denied the Lord the night that Jesus was betrayed. And Jesus restored him to fellowship and restored him to service. And he told him that he was to feed his sheep. And then we were given the account in the chronological fashion from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and even the book of Acts that uh, Reese gave us of what is normally referred to as the Great Commission. And if you have our reading material and the notes that I put in there, you, know, you will have noticed that I made mention in each of those how they differed just a little bit and how that the Baptist would probably always migrate to Matthew chapter 28 for the Great Commission. And the Pentecostal people would probably always migrate to Mark chapter 16 verses 15 through 18 for their great commission. And then uh, possibly the Catholics would rather read from John's account, chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. And then we also saw Luke and Acts, the account. Well, when we get in 
farther to the book of Acts and the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote. When we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'll point out to you what I believe is the Great Commission for you and me in our day and age. But that's just a personal opinion and it's uh, probably better not to argue about those things. So then we came to the time when Jesus' last appearance and his ascension. And we came to the end of the gospel accounts. Mark chapter 16, Luke 24, and John chapter 20. And we also then were reading from Acts chapter 1. And uh, we noticed the last words that John the apostle wrote in his gospel. Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So notice that the first day of this week, we read of the crucifixion. Two days later, we entered into the book of Acts, which meant there were only two days of reading remaining in the gospel accounts that were considered and pointed out by uh, Reese, and I would agree with that, that we had entered into the dispensation of grace or the church age, because most uh, people believe that the church began at Pentecost, and we're coming to that when we come into the first and second chapters of the book of Acts. What that reminds us is that by far the majority of the writings and the volumes in all four Gospels technically take place and were written during the dispensation of the law or during the Old Testament time or the Old Covenant time. So in our English Bibles, we have a differentiation between Old Testament and New Testament. And the New Testament begins with the coming of John the Baptist and his birth, and it begins the first chapters of Matthew and Luke, and then we also see uh, about the birth of Jesus and the coming of Jesus in Mark and John. But technically, the New Testament or the New Covenant, which is mediated by the blood of Christ, actually begins at the crucifixion. Well, then we began reading under a subheading that Reese put in his accounts as the ministries of Paul and Peter. And we haven't even come to Paul yet. In fact, when we first meet him, he's introduced to us as Saul of Tarsus. So the beginning of the book of Acts is all about the nation of Israel and the Jews and the coming of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. By the time we get to the end of the book of Acts, the nation of Israel as a whole will have for the last time rejected Christ as being the Messiah although individuals, Jews from the nation of Israel, uh, even from then all the way up into the present day, uh, trust in Christ and become members of the New Testament church, just like you and I. But the nation as a whole rejected him. And so by the time that we get to the end of the book of Acts, we will have gone chronologic through all of the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, depending upon whether or not you believe he wrote the book of Hebrews. And we will have uh, seen that at the beginning of Acts, all of the people that became members of that church at the day of Pentecost were Jews or proselytes to become Jews. And by the time we get to the end of the book of Acts, the majority of the people that are coming to know Christ will be Gentiles at that time. So the book of Acts is a transition period. And uh, I think that we're best suited to get our New Testament doctrine from the epistles and especially the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote. Well, we read in uh, the first chapter of Acts and we moved into the second chapter of Acts uh, after Christ's ascension and uh, the day of uh, Pentecost had come. And Reese gave a, a, gave a subheading of from the resurrection to Pentecost. And I would say that it's probably from the ascension to Pentecost up until this time. And then when Pentecost comes, uh, we'll see the beginning of the church. But just prior to that, we see that in the upper room, Peter and the other 10 apostles 
and as many people, possibly as 120 people, were in an upper room someplace in Jerusalem, and they cast lots to determine who would take the place of Judas Iscariot. And that's the last time that we find in the Bible any mentioning of casting of lots. It was a big thing during the Old Testament time and the uh, dispensation of the law. But after the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit guides and directs people, then we no longer see anything mentioned in Scripture about casting lots. But they cast lots and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was chosen uh, to take the place of Judas Iscariot. There is controversy over that. Some very good Bible scholars believe that they were in error in doing that and thinking that Paul the Apostle should have been that one to take the place of uh, Judas Iscariot. I have a different opinion of that. I believe that they were correct in choosing Matthias and that they were led by the Holy Spirit and through this casting of lots. And I believe that the Apostle Paul was in a different ministry than those particular 11 or then 12 and that their ministry ended up being directed predominantly to the Jewish people and Paul's ministry began uh, and focused primarily, although he always tried to win the Jews to Christ. He even said at one time that he would be willing to give up his salvation if it would mean the salvation of all of his Jewish brethren. But the majority of his ministry was focused to the Gentiles. In fact, he referred to himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, we finally get to this uh, Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost, 10 days after Jesus' ascension. And his instruction had been for them to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for the Holy Spirit. And he, we read that they were all in one place, in one accord, in one place. And we don't know if that was the whole 120 or if it was just the 12 apostles at that time. It doesn't say. And there's differing opinions on that. But we read how the Holy Spirit came and filled them, baptized them with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and that's the only time that we read of that. We read a filling of the Holy Spirit afterwards, but we don't ever read a baptizing of the Holy Spirit like that again. We do read, and we'll find when we get to the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that Paul will say that we are all baptized by one Spirit into the body of Christ. And that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we trust in Christ, and Christ uh, then uh, has his spirit come to dwell within our spirit. We'll get to that when we get to Paul's writing in Corinthians. But these people then were given <clears throat> this Holy Spirit power to be able to teach and to preach the gospel message in many different languages that they did not previously know. And there was such a commotion that people, remember it was Pentecost, and it was one of those three times that they had feasts or festivals in Jerusalem that all able-bodied Jewish men were supposed to migrate to Jerusalem to observe. And it uh, was a time when there would be Jewish people from many different countries around the known world at that time would have migrated here and many of them would not have spoken a Greek or Hebrew. And they were then allowed to hear the gospel message in their native tongue. And we were given uh, six or eight different uh, nationalities of uh, people, although they were Jews, but that were the, the places where they came from. And they were all able to hear the gospel message in their own language and in their own dialect. And Peter preached his first uh, sermon. And from it, he quoted a portion of Joel chapter 2. And then Peter said to them in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So the words in that verse 38 had given rise to various interpretations and explanations and beliefs about baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit. And that's another reason that I believe that we're uh, well suited to get our doctrine for operating in the New Testament church from the epistles rather than from the book of Acts. And as we go through the book of Acts, uh, we'll read and I'll point out times when there seemingly are changes in the order of believing, 
uh, receiving the Holy Spirit and being baptized. And those will most of the time refer to water baptism, but not always. So we'll cover that controversy in depth as we come to it. We saw that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. And so that is what's recognized as the beginning of the church by most Bible scholars. Peter preached a second Pentecost sermon in chapter 3, and it began with the healing of a lame man outside the temple area. And it uh, this nation of Israel as a whole, uh, represented by the religious leaders, did not accept this uh, teaching in Jesus, and they ended up uh, arresting Peter and John and putting them in jail overnight. And they had apparently that man who had been healed there, and they couldn't deny the miracle that had happened. But they threatened them and told them not to be teaching in his name anymore, in the name of Jesus. And we see where that uh, Peter asked them whether it was better to listen to what men have to say or to listen to what God tells them. And uh, he gave them a very important statement. And it's in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 when he said that there is no salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so then the Sanhedrin could not deny what had happened. The Sanhedrin were that group of religious leaders that were kind of holding court over them. And they couldn't deny what had happened, so they just commanded them not to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. And then was when Peter and John said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. So after further threatening them, they let them go. Then Peter and John shared their experience with the rest of the apostles, and they had a prayer service. And they didn't pray not to be persecuted or arrested anymore. What we find them praying for, and all through their ministries, is that they will be found faithful uh, to speak the word of God boldly. And we saw that the church continued to grow. Then we read about this story of Ananias and Sapphira who were put to death because of their lying about how much money they gave to the church and for the people in need after having sold a piece of property. And it's not that they didn't give everything, it's that they lied about what they gave. It was their property before they sold it. The proceeds of it were theirs after they sold it. And it was nothing wrong with them keeping back a portion of it. But the problem they had was that they lied and wanted people to think that they gave it all. And they were kind of made an example of, and it caught the attention of a lot of people and it was a fearful thing for them. But uh, Peter and John were then, and some other apostles probably too, were imprisoned a second time and an angel freed them in the middle of the night and told them to go to the temple and to teach uh, the words of life as they had been doing. So the next day, having not been found in prison and someone saying, well, they're in the temple area teaching again. So they were brought to the Sanhedrin again. And they said that we ought to obey God rather than men. And this time they were beaten and then let go. And then they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Then we read about uh, seven servants. Many people refer to them as the first deacons that were chosen to help take care of the widow ladies and the dispen dispensing of the food and uh, the needs of the people there in the Jerusalem area. And we read uh, the names of those seven. A couple of them that stood out were Stephen and Philip. And we read in chapter 6 and chapter 7 of Stephen's ministry and life and how he gave a great synopsis of the spiritual roller coaster ride that the nation of Israel had gone through from the time of Abraham up to the present day. And it was, we read that when they looked upon him, his, his face was that, that appeared like an angel. And uh, they couldn't stand the things that he said any longer. And uh, they ended up stoning him before he finished. And we read that just prior to his death, he prayed and asked God not to hold that sin to their account. Really, 
a tremendous testimony uh, for Stephen. And then we were introduced at this time to this Saul of Tarsus because the people that stoned Stephen, we read, laid their apparel, their coats and whatever at the feet of Saul of Tarsus, who probably was a young man at that time. Remember that he will have been raised as a Pharisee and we'll read more about him as time goes on and as we did this week. So then we read about Paul persecuting the church and then we read how in the chronology of things, Reese put in there some ministry experiences of Philip and how he uh, stopped a sorcerer from uh, purchasing the Holy Spirit. He was in an area preaching and the sorcerer supposedly became a believer and professed uh, to believe in Christ. And then when Peter and the rest of the apostles got there and he saw this laying on of hands and the power of the Holy Spirit, he asked if he could purchase the Holy Spirit with money. And we saw Peter rebuking him. Then we read about uh, Philip being led out to the outskirts of town where he caught up with a Ethiopian eunuch on a, uh, a cart headed back to Ethiopia. And he was reading uh, from the Bible from an area of the book of Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit uh, led him, uh, led Philip to uh, go alongside the cart, the wagon and this eunuch and to ask him if he understood what he read. And the eunuch said, well, how can I accept somebody uh, explains it to him. So Philip got up in the wagon with him and they were reading in the area that we recognize as the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And they went a little ways and they came to a body of water. The eunuch asked him, what keeps me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart that Christ is the son of God, you can be baptized. And he said, I do believe. So they got down out of the wagon and they went and Philip baptized the eunuch there in the water. And then we read that he was, Philip was caught away out of his sight. And we read over that quite often and don't think about it. But that's an example of the rapture. The rapture, the Greek word harpazo, the uh, Latin word rapturo, means a snatching away or being caught away or caught up. And that's exactly what we read. The spirit caught him away and he was found in another place. And that was an example of a rapture. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the epistles, especially the writings of the apostle Paul. Well, Paul then, <clears throat> whose name was still Saul of Tarsus at this time, we read in his uh, attempts to persecute the believers in every place that he could, were get, was given letters of authority to go to Damascus and to gather people of uh, that were of the way or believers there and bring them back to Jerusalem to be persecuted and taken to court. And we read how that on the way to Damascus, the Lord appeared to him as a bright shining light and spoke to him. And in fact, it was so bright that he was blind for a period of time, about three days. And he was converted to Christ at that time on the road to Damascus. And he was then led to Damascus and Ananias was a man there in Damascus that was led by the Spirit to go and to minister to Paul and to lay his hands on him. And Paul received his sight and he was baptized. And immediately then Paul began to teach in the synagogues that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Remember that he had been uh, a Pharisee. In fact, uh, he will tell us in his own testimony later on when we read about him that he exceeded uh, all of his peers in being uh, a very uh, zealous Pharisee and uh, proceeding beyond what his peers did. And yet he became uh, Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. And having been a Pharisee like that, raised at the feet of Gamaliel, a famous Bible teacher, he would have known many, many of the Old Testament prophecies that pointed towards Christ. And when he became a believer, and it was like the unbelief and the veil of 
uh, not understanding was taken away, all of a sudden those Old Testament scriptures that he was familiar with, would have did, it would have been very clear to him that they referred to Christ and he began to reason with people in the, the synagogues. Well, uh, people didn't like that. There was uh, word put out that they were gonna try to put him to death and so he escaped from Damascus and we read that he spent three years in the Arabian desert. And my opinion is that that's where he received the direct revelation from Jesus himself while he was there that gave him the information about his ministry and the things that he taught and said and wrote about. Then we read that back in the Jerusalem area, Peter healed a man named Aeneas and he brought a woman named Dorcas back to life after she had died. And we read that Peter uh, spent time uh, in the house or the home of a tanner named Simon. And then we read uh, yesterday about the Holy Spirit directing Peter to go to a Roman centurion's house, a man named Cornelius, who was a godly man, but he was unsaved. He didn't understand about the Messiah, about Christ, about the crucifixion and the resurrection and the sacrifice for sins that Christ gave on the cross. And the Holy Spirit uh, led Peter uh, to go back to Cornelius' house and he shared the gospel with him. And... Uh, he was saved. And so that's the beginning of the presentation and the sharing of the gospel message to Gentile people. Then Paul de or Peter defended that and the results of him being saved in his household to the other Jews that didn't like the fact that Peter went to a, a Gentile's house. We read how that the church began in Antioch, Syria, and that Barnabas was there and Paul had gone back to Tarsus by this time, but Barnabas, realizing that uh, Paul would be a great uh, asset to the newly formed church in Antioch, sent for Paul to come from Tarsus, and Paul and Barnabas ministered in this church that was begun at Antioch, and that's in Syria. Can you imagine that? And it, we read that uh, people were first, be, uh, first called Christians in Antioch, and that's in Syria. Syria is on the northern border of Israel and to the north and to the east of Lebanon. And they're right there where the enemies of the Israelites are today. But here we read in scripture at one time, the gospel was well received there. And people were first referred to as Christians at Antioch. Then we were introduced to the book of James. James was the half brother of Jesus who didn't become a believer, I don't think, until after Jesus' resurrection. And we read the five chapter book of the book of James. And we read at the beginning of it that he directed it and wrote it to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And we have a tendency to read over those things and to not think about them. But remember, this was to the 12 tribes. In other words, there were no lost tribes. He wrote his book of James to all of the members of the 12 tribes that were scattered throughout the world because of persecution. So none of the tribes have been lost. We finished uh, our reading today with finishing the book of James. And there were a whole lot of things in the book of James that uh, are very good. We'll compare what James had to say with what Paul has to say. Sometimes people think that they oppose one another. And when we get to the writings of Paul and the books of Romans and Galatians will explain how that they agree. But one of the things that James said that uh, sticks out is that faith by itself without works is dead. What Paul will teach us is the faith that saves also produces good works. And we'll have more to say about that when we get to his writings. And then uh, James said, it's no big deal to believe even the demons believe and they shudder or they tremble. Then there were lots of other important sayings in the book of James. Peter then was imprisoned and was delivered out of prison and went to the prayer meeting that was held, uh, being held for him. And then we read also at the end of our reading this week about the death of Herod. 
And that brought us to the end of a very busy and full week of reading of a whole lot of events that took place from the time of the resurrection of Christ after the crucifixion all the way to the day of Pentecost and beyond that into the book of Acts, the ministries of Peter and Paul. And next week we'll work our way further into the book of Acts and see about the ministries and the missionary journeys of the apostle Paul and, and how that the gospel is just like what Jesus told the apostles there prior to his ascension from the Mount of Olives, that you will receive power after that you receive the Holy Spirit and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. And we'll see that the gospel indeed will be spread out through all the known world. And that will be our direction and focus uh, beginning with next week's reading. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that it gives us, for the strengthening of our faith. Thank you for the prophecies that we can read in your word that have come to pass literally just as you said in the Bible. And it gives us hope and faith and assurance that the prophecies that you've given that have not yet come to pass will indeed one day come to pass just as literally as the other ones. Thank you for those who join us online. We pray for your blessings upon them and their families and their homes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hope that you have a great weekend and a great Lord's Day tomorrow. Enjoy fellowshipping with other believers. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, Lord bless you.